Okay, so today we are fortunate to have Professor Gabriela Steidel from the Technical University of Berlin, who is going to tell us about curve-based approximation of measures on manifolds. Uh, thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation to the summer school. And also thank you very much that I can do some commercial at the beginning, namely in next spring in March, we will have the same conference on, on image imaging science in Berlin. And um, this is a commercial to join this conference. Here you have some, some dates at the web page of SIAM. So for mini symposia and talks, the deadline is in September. And we so far we plan to do it in person, but uh, we will see what happens with Corona in, in the autumn. So, okay, this was just a small commercial on the next SIAM conference on, on imaging science. So, okay, then let's go to my talk. I should make this small, I think, and I should go to the full screen. Oof, is it okay for you? Can you see it? Yes, yes, it's, I can see it fine. Okay, uh, okay. As it was already announced, I will speak about curve-based approximation of measures on manifold by discrepancy minimization. And um, yeah, I'm from the Technik University in Berlin and my original fields of interest are not geometry. The, I'm originally coming from harmonic analysis and optimization. And in my talk and in my research recently, stochastics and also geometry came in and you will see this talk is about geometry, unfortunately not on learning. So, and this work uh, I will speak about is with Martin Ehler from the University in Vienna and Manuel Grave and Sebastian Neumeyer from uh, my group. Okay, so since this is a summer school and I don't know what's the background of the students, I first want to say few words about approximation of curves at all. Then I want to go to my problem, namely the approximation with discrepancies. And so far, everything will be in a continuous setting about approximation results. And then I will do a discretization and show what one can do with this approximation of curves as a show some numerical results. So let me start a little bit what everybody may know to just come a little bit into the field. Okay, I guess everybody knows some special curves, namely lines, which appears in principal component analysis. And here you have the following, you are just given some points. I can only draw it in R2, but of course it works in multi-dimensions. Um, and then what you are searching for is just the line such that the distances or the squared distances of these points from the line become minimal. And so you, what you have to solve is now a minimization problem in G and G is a line here. And in German, the word G is uh, the line is a gerade, so it's also a G. So, okay, and if you think that these points are samples from a distribution, and this is a distribution of a random variable, you can write it in a more continuous way, namely what you want to minimize is over G, the expectation value of the random variable with a certain distribution, as, as uh, these points are sampled from the distribution, and the projection of these points onto the line and you have to square this and this um, can be of course generalized not only for lines but you can do it for subspaces and this is this is a working horse in the dimensionality reduct reduction so far namely principal component analysis so and of course if you have a look at this then your first idea is wow i'm from geometry i should generalize this to many faults and what we have to do here is that we have to replace this euclidean distance by the distance on the manifold and of course we have to replace the line, which is the shortest, um, shortest path between two points by a geodesic. And you can do this. And indeed, there exists a lot of literature on this so far. Um, for example, I hear only very, very few examples, and I have forgotten 100 people here, I think. Fletcher or also Xavier Penek did a lot of work in this field. I can show this is just from a bachelor thesis we did. Here is such a geodesic uh, with respect to these red points on the ball. There's a manifold as a ball here. And Huckemann has done a lot on the ball or also Sommer and Launce. So 
So, but there are many others. So this would be one general generalization of the simple principle component analysis just with one component. So then there exists another um, direction how to generalize this. And maybe this is not that known. This is the direction of so-called principle curves. So what are the principle curves? If you have a look at this expression, it looks very similar to principle component analysis. The only difference is that you replace the line here now by a smooth curve. And the second difference is that you don't look for minima of this expectation value, but for critical points. So, and it can be shown this that, and uh, this goes back to Hasty and Stützle in 1989. And it uh, was also generalized by different people here. I will say something about this. And the interesting thing with these critical points is that they create lines gamma or curves gamma now, uh, which have a special property, and this property is called self-consistency. And what it means, I can show you here or explain you here a little bit. I can also write it down, but if I write it down, I have to write a conditional expectation value, and I want to avoid this. So, okay, for example, assume that you have a uniform distribution on the square here. If you would sample it, you would see uniform points everywhere. So, and then uh, you take, if a curve is a principal curve, like, for example, these blue blue lines here, you can think about the curve who, show, who connects these blue points here. And this is a, is a square, it's not a circle, it's, it's a parabola or part of a parabola here. And then the self-consistency property means the following. You take the, uh, the normals to this line here, and then you take very small areas around these normals. And from these uh, surfaces or from these areas, you take the barycenters. And if you have a look at these barycenters, then you came out with the red line here or with these red points. So these are the barycenters of these areas here. And here, of course, uh, the, the, it goes outside because uh, this here is, is the larger part than the smaller part here. And now you have a self-consistency or you call it such a principal curve if this red line should be the same as this blue line, which is not the case here. Red is not blue here. And so this blue line is not a principal curve for the uniform distribution on the sphere. If you would take instead of the sphere as a, a ball or a quarter of a ball, then you would get such a principal curve, not in the middle here by this radius one half, but with radius two third. This would be, you can show it, this would be such a principal curve. So this is something here again, uniform distribution on the square, and you can find very nice lines here. So, and this can also be done in, in RD somehow. And I was, uh, I will not say too much about it. It was just a reviewer who told us we should have a look at these principal curves, but you will see that they are not as powerful as the things I will show you in this talk. And of course here, you can also think, this is not on the manifold now, this is uh, only in, in linear spaces in RD or here in, uh, is it in R2 only. And there, there are some attempts to generalize it to manifolds also. For, um, these attempts are younger from 2016, but um, it's very rare, these papers about these generalizations. So, okay, but what I want to, also, there is another thing, if you think about curves, these are spline or these zig curves, and you have already seen here that we always try to minimize a certain functional to finding these curves or to find critical points of a functional. And of course, you may know from uh, numerical analysis, if you want to uh, find spline functions or these zig curves or whatever, you also try to minimize the functional for cubic splines with uh, the second derivative of these splines, and you can take it here here in a noisy version that you take just the differences should be small, or you can say, okay, these, um, these function f or this curve f, or here she should be an s, excuse me, this should be an s. The s should go through the curve as s of x, j, s, y, g, for example, this is a typical curve from a lecture of numerical analysis. And there are other uh, splines, like thin plate splines, see here it's correct with the s, and then you minimize another function. And there exists generalization to manifolds, also of these things here are some paper, uh, there are papers of Gaunzenberger, Absel, Bergmann, Rumpf, and Wirth. And I think, um, yeah, here is a typical example of such a spline curve now on, on the sphere. And concerning PCR, that is also one reason why I told it here, there will be a talk of Martin Rumpf about PCA on shape spaces. And then you can remember what I said about these curves here. 
So what I will do is different from all these approaches. I want to do an approximation by so-called push forward measures of curves. So and to this um, end, I have to introduce as a notation a little bit, and I have tried to keep it small. Okay, and the following X is a compact Polish space. That means it's separable, complete matrix space. Think about, think on the sphere or SO3 or some nice manifolds, which you know, and which are compact without boundary. So I consider measures on these spaces and normally the space of measures can be equipped with a norm so that it becomes a Banach space. And usually you take the TV norm. To be honest, I, I cannot really work with TV norms or with this definition, but I really can nicely work with the dual formulation of such spaces, namely these, uh, these measure spaces are just dual spaces of the continuous functions. And as such, you can write the matrix or the matrix in these spaces down as a dual matrix. So you just, you just take the measure here and you integrate it against or you test it against the continuous function, which have a norm in CX in the continuous functions less or smaller than one. So this is the nice definition of this norm in the space of measures MX. So, and with this definition, you can also define the weak star topology on measures. That means that uh, a measure MK converges. It's really weak star in analysis, but people in stochastics, they call it just weak, uh, weak convergence, but it's really weak star um, in, in, in a functional analysis. And we say that it converges weakly to mu if, it, uh, if these integrals here converge for all F in CX, which is usually done if you do dual spaces. So, but we were mainly uh, interested in our application in probability spaces. That means that uh, the that this measure on the wall space X has a measure measure one. So, and what has it to do with my field, namely with image processing, what I want to do is I want to consider images here and I consider these images as, um, as, some, as a function on the torus T2 times T2. Remember, I'm a, on a compact manifold and the compact manifold is the torus in this direction and the torus in this direction. That means the direct product of the torus in both directions. And these gray values are just my function values. And I consider this image as a density function of a probability density distribution. And what I want to approximate is, not, is now these very complicated density functions by line. Yeah. So, and here is what we get from our method later, and I ex will explain you how I get it. This is an approximation of this density distribution by a line. You see, it's much more complicated than just a um, PCA first component or whatever. And I will do not only do this on the torus, I will do this also with images or with functions on manifolds. So good, but let me explain a little bit more what I what I need for this. I need curves. So and I consider continuous curves and I consider closed curves. You can also consider open curves if you want. L gamma, which would be the length of the curve. The length of the curve is closely related with the Lipschitz constant of the curve, which means um, which is defined here, namely that g of s, uh, the distance between g of s and g of t is smaller than a Lipschitz constant L s minus t for all st on 0, 1. And I also only I always parameterize my curves on 0, 1, and they map onto my manifold. Also, for example, onto the torus times torus, or onto the sphere, SO3, or whatever you want. And of course, Lipschitz constant, if you have a constant speed curve, then the length of the curve is equal to the Lipschitz constant. And we have also a relation to the speed, of course, of the curve. But uh, this will not be that important here at least in this talk, in the paper it is. Okay, so what I consider now is um, uh, which curves I consider. I consider so-called push forward, um, push forward measures. Namely, we, I do the following. Also, I, I want to find curves mapping from zero one to our to our money manifold or to our Polish space, which is compact. And um, now I consider, I, as, as I said, I consider my images as measures. And uh, I consider now measures which are defined on or which have the support on these curves. And these measures I define as follows. The curve is in X. Then I go from X back 
by, uh, I take the Ur build or the pre-image of a set, I go back to the interval, and then I take a measure on the interval. Yeah, I take a probability measure on the interval, and this is a push forward measure of, um, of this measure omega by the curve. And this is now a measure which lives on my manifold. And this is a line more or less. Yeah, it's a line. So, and what I now want to find is I want to approximate the given measure as this image of the eye. Yeah, and this measure, of course, this special measure has a density function, is given by a density function. And I want to approximate it by such a push forward measure. And I want to find the correct curve here. And the restriction is that my curve has some assumptions. I will show it in a minute. So, and what is this D here? The D is a special distance between measures, namely a so called discrepancy. And I will say, Say something about discrepancies later. So what I intend to do is my in my talk, I want to show approximation rates. I'm asking myself, how good can I approximate my measure if I make, for example, this curve longer and longer, or if I make, make the Lipschitz constant larger and larger. And in the second part, I want to show some numerical results. Okay, so let us start with approximation results. So to this end, I have to explain a little bit my, my spaces where I want to approximate my, my image, which was I want to approximate my image, and I have to explain what a discrepancy is. So, okay. Yeah, if you think about curves, curves go to points, you one should start really with points. So, and uh, my approximation spaces, which, which I want to approximate my measure mu, which is my image, uh, can also, I want to do it with curves, but I can also do this and I have to say something about it. I can also do this with points. So, and this is, for example, that's why I also consider spaces where I approximate first with points and both are somehow related. So and these are now uh, probability measures where uh, I have points in position xk and these points have some weights and I call this atomic measures. Or I can take the same weights for all points and then I call this empirical measures. And here is a typical example. Here we have an Im as a function on the sphere. These gray values are a function and I approximate this function now by such points and this is indeed an empirical measure because all these points have the same weight or how you can show the weight the points have the same thickness yeah they have the same radius all these points have the same radius and in some areas i have to put more points in order to approximate my continents here and in some areas not if i would approximate it with an atomic measure these points can have different weights that means they can be thicker or smaller they can have different radii so this is typically Typically, what your printer is doing, namely your printer cannot put some gray values on a sheet of papers, it can all, only set points, mirror or not so near points. And so this is an opposite thing to um, to, for example, uh, kernel estimators or something like this, where you have po points are given and you want to find the density functions where these points are taken from. And I have the opposite thing. I have the density functions and want to find a good point distributions with endpoints. So this is also very important if you want to find quadratures or something like this. So, and this is somehow done. This is an old paper or this first earth is from an old paper we did in 2010 or so. But now the next question was to do this with curves, and then we can speak about different curves. We can speak about arbitrary constant speed curves, which uh, are restricted by some Lipschitz constant. We can speak about curves which have a density function here. Lambda is, uh, is, is uh, a Lebesgue measure here. And we can speak just about push forward measures of the Lebesgue measure. So this is a push forward measure where we a low a density. This is something which is related to the smaller and the thicker points. Yeah, here we can approximate with lines which can be thicker or smaller. And here we have always the same thickness of the line and want to approximate our density. Good. Okay. This is these are our approximation spaces, and I want to show results. What happens if this L becomes longer and longer? So what I need for this, because I consider everything from the stochastic measure point of view, is I need a distance between measures, and of course I could 
to takes the total variation distance and takes just total variation between the minus of two measures because measures form a linear space, but this is not a good measure. So then somebody would say, okay, take a Wasserstein distance and I will say something about this Wasserstein distance a little bit later. What I prefer are so-called discrepancies. And these discrepancies has a nice relation to reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Namely, they are defined as follows. I take a function which goes from x times x into the real number should be continuous, symmetric, positive, definite. So this is the so-called Messier kernel in a learning theory. And then it's clear that there exists an orthonormal basis of L to x. Sigma x is a, a, a usual measure on, on this manifold or on this space here. And then this kernel can be written in such a form here. These are orthogonal functions. And the good thing is if alpha k is larger than zero, then these functions are continuous. So, and now what you can do now, you can expand now every function in L to X into a Fourier series with respect to these orthogonal functions and these are the, class, uh, the classical Fourier coefficients. So what are now reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces? You take such a nice kernel here, take the Mercier decomposition, and then uh, to the reproducing Hilbert space belong all functions in of L2 where the Fourier coefficients with respect to these functions have a certain decay. Normally, these alphas are small, so alpha to the power of minus one is large. So the Fourier coefficients, which you obtain here, must be small. It's the same if you have, if you go to Sobolev spaces or wherever, then you can also characterize them by, um, by their Fourier coefficients and you need a very a rather harder decay of these Fourier coefficients. So these are smoothness spaces, which in general, uh, or they are smoother than just continuous functions. And you can also have an inner product here. These reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces have many nice properties. I don't want to go into the details here. So now comes the discrepancy. And the discrepancy um, is defined as a dual or as the norm of the linear operator, uh, which uh, the linear operator, which maps a function phi uh, from uh, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space into to the number phi of x d. And here is, here is the difference of our measures. Mu will be the given measure and nu later will be the measure which, which we want to approximate mu. So, okay, and here is the usual definition of the, uh, of the dual norm. You take phi d mu x minus nu x and you have to maximize over all functions phi, which are now have a norm which is later or smaller, uh, smaller or equal than one in our reproducing kernel Hilbert space. If you have a look again at the usual definition of, of these measures, then you see this definition look really similar. If you take here the difference of two measures, you have also the integral of phi mu minus nu, if you take here mu minus nu, but you take the maximum over all continuous function. And here it's different in the discrepancy. You take here the, the the maximum over all functions in this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And then you can rewrite this discrepancy here. And I rewrite it here by the help of this reproducing kernel. And then you came to such an expression, this is straightforward calculation. And then you can make one step more and, and insert here the decomposition, this the spectral decomposition of the kernel. And then you finally arrive at such a formula. That means you can compute these discrepancies by just taking the Fourier coefficients of uh, your measure mu and the measure nu. So, and you can also show if your nu k, if a measure nu k converges, uh, uh, weekly to nu, then nu k converges weekly to nu, then this is equivalent that the disc discrepancy between here should be a nu instead of a nu mu. The nu and the nu k go to zero. This should be a nu. So you can des describe this weak convergence by a discrepancy. So let me give you an example, maybe an intuitive example what such a discrepancy really means. And here is an example from our earlier work in 2010 where we wanted to do everything just with points. So, okay, take as reproducing kernel Hilbert, uh, as reproducing kernel C minus X minus Y. And you have to believe me that in R2, this is really a reproducing kernel. It has this nice property or on the torus two times two, it is such a thing. So then we don't have a continuous measure here. Our measure is an image. And this time I don't consider it as a continuous, as an analog image. I just consider it as, as a discrete image. And the gray values of this image are hidden in these weights 
W and I, I, it's opposite to what is in images. W is one if uh, the point is black and W is zero if the point is white. So, and then I have the image consists of, um, yeah, you can consider it as, um, as a measure which is distributed at the grid points IJ with different gray values, W, I, J, okay? And since I want to speak about probability measures, I assume that the sum of all these gray values in this image is equal to one. So, and what I want to do now, if I want to do uh, approximation by points, and I want to do it with an empirical measures, all points have the same thickness, then I want to approximate this image by uh, this measure here, that means I want to find the position of the points such that these guys are near to each other. So I plug this in into the definition here, and then I plug in this measure and this measure here, which is mu n now. And then after some computations, I see the following. This becomes very special terms, namely it consists of a first and a second part. So in this first part, it comes from from uh, the, the, also this is mu is given, this is your image, so this is a constant. If you minimize something, it plays no rule. And this part comes now from my different distributions from these both here, and I want to minimize this. And it means the following. If W is large, if it is black, for example, yeah, this is, this is the largest thing, then if I want to minimize, then my position xk has to be really near to this position in order to make this thing small large times small is again small. So, okay, but if I would have only this first part, which I call attraction part, um, then it, it would not really work because all my points would go to the blackest point, yes? And then comes the second part here into the play this part here. And this is indeed a repulsion part, namely here you have the distance between the, the points and you have a minus here. So this part becomes really, uh, really small because you have this minus if the points are far away from each other. So you have the black values attract your points and the, uh, and the other part, the repulsion part, put them um, yeah, uh, into different positions and what you obtain is such, a, uh, such an image, for example, for 30,000 points. So this was with points. So now let's come to um, go a little bit further to my approximation results. And here I take special reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, namely so-called Sobolev spaces. And uh, you can explain Sobolev spaces via the Laplace Beltrami operator. And um, if you have the Laplace Beltrami operator, you know that the Laplace Beltrami operator has very smooth eigen has smooth eigenfunctions, which are given here. And then you can construct kernels by the help of these eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And you can put also some um, eigenfunctions here. And these kernels are very nice Mercier kernels. And by the help of these kernels, you can uh, you can um, construct reproducing Hilbert spaces, and these are exactly the spaces HS, these uh, normal uh, Hilbert spaces, which you can also characterize in such a way, or you can characterize this by as a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So Sobolev spaces, these smoothness spaces are reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And in the following, I want only to consider this phi k. So the nice thing is that um, if you have eigenvalues of the Laplace Beltrami operator, there exists a result of while, which told you if you have eigenvalues which are smaller or equal than r or r square, how many eigenfunctions belong to such eigenvalues. And here is a number, and I need this in my proof. So, for example, if you're on the sphere, then these are the eigen, or on the d sphere, these are the eigenvalues of uh, by Laplace Beltrami or the negative Laplace Beltrami operator and the corresponding eigenfunction. And you can count how many belong to these eigenvalues here as a, um, the, the spherical harmonics. So, and then you can plug on a kernel, you take these spherical harmonics, you take some decay in the Fourier coefficients, and for this you came out, for example, with such a kernel here. So this is just to illustrate this uh, theorem of Weil and how to construct how these, how these Hilbert spaces and reproducing kernels come into the play. Good, okay, and here is now a result. What was already known is if you want to approximate an, an, a measure mu by a point measure, this N is now stands for the number of points, then you can approximate the approximation rate as N to the power of minus one half. It doesn't depend on the dimension. If this is a measure mu in 1000 dimensions, the approximation rate does not depend on the dimension. It's just minus one half. So, and now if we make our uh, discrepancy dependent on the 
the kernel if our reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a, is a, is a Sobolev space, as I have shown you, then one can prove a little bit more, namely that the discrepancy now is n to the power of minus s divided by d, and since, since s for some embedding results is larger than d half, this is better than this uh, result here, but uh, yeah, it's, an, it's just another distance. So, and then you can go into, um, you can ask what happens if I take curves now, so far I have only points. And then what happens is something which you may expect because you have one dimension less, as curves are one dimensional, points are zero dimensional to say, and then you get instead of this D here, a D minus one. And this is interesting how to prove these things. Namely, you prove it via this Y result, you count how many eigenfunctions belong to special eigenvalues and the generalization result about, uh, and the result or a generalization of a result on a quadrature rule on manifolds. And Brandolini and co-workers have proven an interesting or a, a result, which you may know if you think about numerical uh, numerics uh, courses in numerical analysis one, namely, if you have that as special functions, namely the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator, um, can be integrated with respect to an arbitrary measure. Indeed, this is a generalization because Brandolini did it also for only for the canonical measures on, on X, but you can do it with arbitrary measures. And if you have a quadrature, this integral can be computed exactly by using another measure. And this can be, for example, a point measure on the right hand side, maybe a quadrature rule, yeah, that you have that you have weights and that you have quadrature points, and then you can integrate some of these, or you can compute some of these integrals in an exact way, but only for very special functions here, namely for, for this eigenfunctions for the Laplace Beltrami operator with eigenvalues smaller than R square. Then you can show that you can integrate any function with respect to this measure just by a quadrature rule, which is given here. And um, the approximation error, which we, you will do by this integration, is r to the power of minus s, where r is just uh, the number of these eigenvalues. Yeah, So you can come with a quadrature rule very near to this function f. And these results can be used to prove such uh, approximation results. So and here, this maybe I skipped this because this time has gone. And we did very special considerations then for, for curves and for the SO three and uh, also for Grassmannian manifolds. And uh, yeah, we have shown that this, um, we have shown it for more special curves, namely for curves having a, a density functions and for curves, which are just push, push forward measures of the Lebesgue measure. And here we cannot, um, yeah, we need here that the density is a little bit smoother. We guess that it can be also shown for arbitrary measures, but so far we don't have the proof for this. Because this proof is essentially different. We construct really curves for which this um, approximation rate can be achieved. And we do it via results on Euler graphs. It's Königsberger Brücken problem of Euler and we use these things to prove something. So just a remark on Wasserstein distances. You may say why she uses discrepancies. You can, you can also use Wasserstein distances. For Wasserstein distances are something unknown for point measures if you have n point, but you see the, 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 the rate depends here on the dimension. It's n to the power of minus one divided by d. And there exists some results in this direction. So far I've seen nothing about curves in this direction. This is just about points. So and just to mention a relation between Wasserstein Wasserstein distances and discrepancies. Uh, if somebody knows Wasserstein distances, maybe he also knows synchron divergences. These are entropy regularized Wasserstein distances, and they have to do something for debiasing them. And then one can show that if in the synchron uh, divergences this epsilon goes to infinity, then the Wasserstein distance approaches a discrepancy where the cost function of the Wasserstein distance and the kernel are related in such a way here. So, okay, this is just, there exists the relation between Wasserstein distances and discrepancies. So now I want to compute with these things. These are pure approximation results and I have only shown a few of our results. So what I want to really to compute is, I want to take curves which are push forward measures of the Lebeck measure on the interval. Yeah, Also this third direction of curve, no, no thicker curves, just one curve. So, and I want to minimize this. So of course, if I want to minimize this, curves are still continuous guys. And if I want to do numerics, I have to go back to points. I go back to the equispace point, and then I uh, push forward these uh, discrete measures here by the curve. So then I come, come to my manifold, and I, I want to 
take, oh, I want to minimize this expression here over all curves such that uh, the, the way from one point to the other one is the shortest geodesic and that the length or the better the Lipschitz constant of the curve is bounded by L. So, and if I do this, I can show something, namely that uh, if I um, take these special curves here, R, L, N, then these curves gamma converges to curves which are in A, L. That means to curves which are not related to these points, but just our Lipschitz curve, which uh, bounded Lipschitz constant. One can show something here. So, okay, and now how I compute this. Okay, I need now, uh, I want to um, minimize this. So I need a special kernel. I, I have shown that these discrepancies are related to Fourier transforms here. I go into the Fourier domain here with respect to these uh, eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. This is an infinite sum. I have to cut it somewhere. So that means I have to cut the kernel somewhere. It's an infinite sum here, but I have to cut it at some distinction r. And then what I finally minimize is this expression here. And I penalize the constraint, namely that our my gamma has to be in this space. I penalize it here as a regularizer. And this is just done here. And then I come to such an expression. And I want to minimize this now with respect to, um, to, this, uh, to these points here, to these points xi. And then I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, now, put a geodesics between these xi's. So as I have shown on the previous slide here, are these geodesics here. So I minimize with respect to points here again and the length of the curve. So, okay, let me show some numerical results. The good thing is, as I, I show only results on the torus, and I have also or, already shown some results on the sphere with these continents, what happens there, and I show some results on, and I have shown a result on yeah, on the torus. Yeah, I've also shown, shown a, a side with this I, but I show again something and on the Grassmannian and on SO3. And what we use for minimizing this is nonlinear CG on manifolds with, um, yeah, with some specialities. And for this, one can show superlinear convergence of to a local minimum of the functional. And I, uh, I take um, the good thing is for all these manifolds, I know the of the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And I can put all derivatives which I need in the algorithm. I can just uh, put it to the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And moreover, I'm uh, a Fourier guy. I said I'm coming from harmonic analysis. I will use Fourier transform at non equis based grids to make the computation fast. We need a multi-scale strategy and so on. And here is something on the complexity and maybe I can skip this, but if there are questions, it, it's, it's fast. So, okay, let me show some results instead. Uh, the first thing is you have seen there are many parameters. I have to cut my, my kernel. I have a length of my kernel. I have some points which I put here and I have the regularization parameter. But nevertheless, one can find a very good heuristics how these things should be related and also related with your, with your discrepancy with this S. And if you uh, have a look at this and you really follow this hint or this guide how to choose these three par parameters, R, L, and alpha, then you came up really with a good approximation uh, of these measures. And here these points are the approximation which we achieve with our method. If we compute the discrepancies, it becomes smaller and smaller. And the blue line is the theoretical guess uh, of our discrepancy, how it should fall down. So, okay, so this is, works really fine. And here's a typical example. This is again this i, and then we start with a curve of a certain length, and we make a larger, 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 and you see that finally this i becomes better and better, and it's approximated by these lines. So this is on the torus t2 times t2. You can do think this can do the same on the torus t t times t times t. And uh, this is, for example, this head of Spock. And uh, we smoothed this um, around here. And then we do the same. We approximate it by a line. And we do it and more and more. And I can also put a video and uh, rotate it. And this is what, what's go going on here. Here is an example on the rotation group, which maybe I should also skip because time went a little bit. 
Uh, but here is a nice example. This is an example for the Grassmannian G24. This Grassmannian is, uh, Grassmannian is a manifold of all um, two-dimensional hyperspaces in a four-dimensional space. And this is a little bit a white unicorn among these Grassmannians. You can, uh, you can define Grassmannians for an arbitrary K and an arbitrary N here, but this is two and four. And the speciality is that it is isometrically two the S2 times the S2, uh, and you have to take the North Pole out and the South Pole. So, and then you can um, you can show graphically what's going on here. Namely, you take for the first S2 is now the position in R3, and the second S2 is just an RGB value, a color value. So, and what I'm showing here is the approximation of the uniform distribution on this Grassmannian. Right? You have a uniform distribution. And um, yeah, and what happens here, and um, two points are the same if they have the same color and the same position. And you see how this is now approximated if I make the length larger and larger. And then you get finally these worms here, which is um, the approximation of the uniform distribution on S2 times S2. So these are two things, color and position. Okay, so let me come to uh, the conclusions. I have shown approximation results of measures by measures which are supported on a curve. And I have done this for compact finite dimensional Riemannian manifolds without boundary. And the theory goes through for the practice I have used that I know the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator for the computations to make the computations fast. Yeah. So then uh, what are the advantages of discrepancies? What I see or where I see the advantages? First, I want to mention that they are related to what Wasserstein distances, and maybe you have a look into our paper where we explained it a little bit more, but it was already done by French colleagues, um, then, uh, but not in this, uh, not with discrepancies. Um, then, um, okay, we can show approximation rates for curve approximation. Uh, independent of the dimensionality, but yeah. Then if you have seen this nice interpretation of the discrepancies in terms of at attraction and repulsion, and I'm not aware of such a description in terms of Wasserstein distances. And um, yeah, because I'm a Fourier guy, I can use Fourier techniques in order to compute these things. I have to say that curves on such, uh, not on manifolds, but on in R3, or yeah, I think in R3, but mainly in R2, were also computed by minimizing Wasserstein distances by uh, French colleagues around Le Brat. And, um, but they need a lot of time to compute this, or they need more time to compute it. And uh, I think the results are not that as good as our results. So, okay, because we can use these fast Fourier transform techniques. Moreover, in, in future, there are some real world applications also by French colleagues in MRI, where the really good MRI devices where you can go a path along these MRI distributions uh, which uh, follows or which approximates some density here and this is done by the group of um, either not the group by Royer, uh, Pierre Weiss, Chauffeur and other people and um, yeah they have also used it for engraving if you engrave in wood or so you want to have a line and if you want to engrave a face or whatever you need lines and not points and finally you can use it for grand tour for grand tour on Grassmannians if you want to visualize how to approximate things by by planes, for example. And then you can use these techniques really to, to go to visualize how um, points can be approximated by uh, subspaces of dimension two. Okay, this is just what I want to show you, what, what we have done with curves. It's a little bit different from these principal curves or from the Z curves, which we, we may have seen in other talks at the summer school. And here are some of our papers. The first papers were just on points where we want to approximate densities with points. And then we came with this curve approximation. This is a paper where you see something about optimal transport and the relation to discrepancies. And recently, where we're, also when we wrote this paper here, then a reviewer said um, we should have a look at these principal curves, but we, we find out that they are not really suited to uh, approximate, uh, approximate such very complicated things like images or, 
or other things, these principal curves are nice to approximate maybe uniform distributions or something like this. And moreover, there exist no extensions or just one or two extensions to manifolds so far. But we wrote a paper now or we are just finishing a paper about dynamical system of principal curves because these principal curves, you have an energy functional and you can guess that these principal curves can be of course also described by uh, ordinary differential equations. And uh, yeah, but in RD, seems not to exist, but maybe somebody knows more about this. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you very much for your attention. And maybe there are some questions on the topic, uh, comments or whatever, and I like to answer this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, very nice. Perhaps we can all thank the speaker. So maybe stop recording. <laughs> Uh, yes, there, there are indeed several questions. Um, the first question was asked early on during the talk before you'd mentioned Wasserstein in detail, but it has a lot of upvotes, so I am going to ask it. Uh, the TV distance induces quite a strong topology. Is there any reason to prefer it to a weaker metric such as Wasserstein, since also with Wasserstein 1 has a complete metric space and it's relatively easy to compute or approximate? The TV, uh, I would prefer Wasserstein over TV, but to minimize over Wasserstein distances is not so easy to, to compute. If you do it with Wasserstein 1, you can do something, but Wasserstein itself is, in, you have to minimize something. And then you have to, again, to minimize before the Wasserstein distance. And you can do it via Laguerre tessellations and, and other things, but I wouldn't say that this is very simple. Discrepancies are much simpler in my, in my way because you can just, uh, um, yeah, if you have, want to do some algorithms where you can just use uh, gradient descent algorithms for example, or CG algorithms. And whenever you have to compute in the CG algorithm a derivative, you can just put the derivative to, to, the, uh, um, to these uh, spherical harmonical functions or to the functions from the lab, eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. So, and, and uh, I, I, the TV distance is, is really not good for measures because it, it doesn't have a look at the distance between them. This is all, already for simple Gaussians. If you want to compare to Gaussians or so, and it takes a TV distance, then it doesn't take care how, how far away these Gaussians from each other, for example. So it's, it's usual that you take the Wasserstein distance versus, or other distances. And by the way, these, these discrepancies are the same as MMSA distances if you take uh, squared kernels. And MMSA is, is something which is used in GANs, generative adversarial networks. You can also take Wasserstein distances there. But um, uh, yeah, there are some discussions now if this is really better. Maybe you know the paper of Carola Schönieb and her group that Wasserstein distances in generative adversarial networks only so nice because they don't approximate the Wasserstein distance in a correct way. <laughs> so this is a little bit. So yeah. You could also take Kohlbeck Leibner and try if you want, but uh, yeah, this frequency has this very, very nice relation to Fourier analysis. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you just said that because the question I was about to ask was um, Has this definition of discrepancy been tried in machine learning instead of vast assigned distance or more complicated divergences? And uh, you, you answered me even before I'd asked it. Yeah, it's, it's the MMSE. For yeah. special kernels, it's MMSE. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can do it more general and call, call it discrepancies, and then you can try something there. Mm. But, uh, the, uh, next question, the next question is, does the approximation depend on the quality or density of the target measure? For example, the image is discrete on a computer. No. Also, so far, what we are doing is, is really semi-discrete. Semi that means we, if we compute, uh, compute the Fourier coefficients, uh, these can be given continuously or it can be given on a grid. But um, the thing is, <laughs> if, if you have points, then you have, um, then you have to sample from the density, which is given in a correct way. Then you can approximate this, but then you have already the points. Also, you can do for the following. OK, one suggests. If you have an image, you can try to, to sample from this image, which I consider as a density function. But already sampling from this image is one thing which is really hard. You have seen this. You have to put the points at the correct places. Yeah, And then, of course, you can try to approximate this by a curve, for example, using, using traveling salesman strategies. But if you have all these points, on the sphere, then it appears, and this is something we just want to do, that we can do traveling salesmen better with our strategy than just to find the, the shortest way between these points. If you if you see what I what I mean, you can of course you can approximate a continuous measure like your face, which is given on a grid. And you can approximate us by, by, by say Floyd algorithm or whatever. But um, then you have points, of course. But uh, yeah, then you have still two 
to uh, relate these points by a curve. Yeah, and this will, uh, traveling salesman also takes a while. Mm, and indeed, indeed, in one of our proofs, we, we also use this relation between points and the traveling salesman problem. So yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. So does this does this area then give a new perspective on the traveling salesman problem as a kind of you know classical problem in computer science that you're trying to that's meant to be very very hard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this was not the intuition to do this. The intuition come from, came from our French colleagues who did it with Wasserstein distances and had some trouble with their numerics. And then we started and say, okay, we did everything with, uh, they did it with points and with lines. And then we said, okay, uh, 10 years ago, we did it with discrepancies and points. Now let us, let us do this with lines. Let's first understand what they are doing. And then we could do it uh, yeah, with our numerical things. This was the intuition. But then we like to prove something. And in one of these proofs, which I haven't shown, I haven't shown our, all our approximation results, we really use this idea of traveling salesman. Thanks. Okay, but thank maybe you, uh, um, so far we haven't done, it was an idea to solve the traveling salesman problem in a better way by using our approach. But so far we haven't done this. First find the points and then yeah, smooth them and yeah. Great. Uh, the next question is, the conventional folklore is that kernel-based discrepancies are weaker than Wasserstein distances. It is easier for d mu nu to be low than for w mu nu to be low. For that reason, I am not sure what is the insight we get by comparing the minimum obtained by the approximations using the Wasserstein distance, that scales as n to the power of minus one over d, versus kernel-based discrepancies. Would you mind re-explaining that point? Okay, this is a good question. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I have not really an answer to this so far. I have to say, because if you uh, if you take this, um, you have seen this result. If you if you take the kernel a little bit smoother, then you have a result like one d uh, like s divided by n or something like this, and it depends on s. Yeah, and and this s doesn't depend on the measure. It just depends on maybe I, I share the screen again, um, and I show this. Also. Yeah, the relation of this is, is really something um, we are a little bit puzzled about. So, okay, you can take Wasserstein, you can also take discrepancies, but let me show the, the, the definition of these discrepancies. Here, you see this, no? So, and now you can think, okay, you take, uh, this is the maximum here, but, but if you take now a smoother space here, then you have fewer functions in the smoother space. And if you take the maximum over fewer function, it becomes smaller. So it's clear if the space becomes here smoother, that this guy here becomes smaller. And that's why you get an S here. Yeah, so it's somehow intuitive that it should happen. But um, yeah, the relation, uh, these are just approximation results for discrepancies. I have to say there is this nice relation to these, uh, these things here. And yeah, I'm coming from Fourier analysis, but uh, okay. If you want to, and uh, I'm not aware so far, maybe you can, uh, maybe the speaker knows if there are some results meanwhile, meanwhile for Wasserstein distances, I go to these Wasserstein distances now. Ah, yeah, here you have the traveling salesman. I, I skipped this slide here where the traveling salesman proof can be used. Um, where are the Wasserstein distances? Here, genau. Um, I'm not so sure if there, also there, in Wasserstein distances, there doesn't exist too many results because we are really on a manifold. And uh, here you are also on a manifold, but mu must be absolutely continuous. It must have a density. And then you can estimate for atomic measures, you have an estimate like this, but here the density comes into the play. And there exists an, a result for non-atomic, for empirical point measures. These are all point measures, no? but this result only exists on a, in a cube. And this is a result on a cube. And um, maybe uh, that uh, since then, since 2018, there are much more results on this, but indeed I haven't seen more results on what to do with Wasserstein distances. And here the P comes into the play and so on. No? And now to do this for lines and for arbitrary manif manifolds, for example, this result here for empirical measures, I haven't seen some think about this, but maybe I'm, this is not the last thing because now as many, are many things on archive and our paper is one year old or so. I should have a look, but maybe somebody knows. And, and for lines, there is nothing here. You know, there's nothing for lines because what, what we can use in our proof is this nice Brandolini result. Yeah, we can use these nice quadrature rule results for our proofs, but I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of some Wasserstein things on the sphere, on Grassmannian's point results, and also not about, I'm not aware of any numerics people can do on, on the, 
on Grassmannians, for example, or SO3 or something like this, or yeah. Okay, so I think we are so far the only ones who can compute these things. Concerning right. approximation, uh, we can discuss. <laughs> it's an interesting point and yeah. Okay. There's time for just a couple more questions. Um, there's some there's some of us who got a bit confused on the dependence of the space X. Is there a reason why you focused on the dimension dependent rates you showed on tori and groups like SO3? Can you do it on a general compact manifold? Yes, I can do it on as the approximation results are on general compact manifolds, but the computational results not. So the, uh, if, I, if I could go back to my slides, then you see that we have these results. This is just, we'll let X be a compact. We have it more, even more general for D, L, for L, L of floor spaces. X is very special spaces in approximation theory. It's not my field, but of Martin Ehler. You can not just compact spaces with a measure. You can do it on more general spaces. And in our paper, it's also on more general spaces, just for the computation and these, these uh, special methods. And for, if you take arbitrary lines, measures yeah not but if you take push forward measures of um, of um, absolutely continuous measures on the line then we have only these results for these special manifolds because for these special manifolds we have an explicit construction how to construct these these curves yeah up to a constant and and yeah. for but for arbitrary measures um, supported uh, on, on 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 a line you can do this for arbitrary x but for these special measures, push forward measures of Lebesgue measures, for example, we have only results for, for these special manifolds, torus in some dimensions, spheres, these spheres, SO3, Grassmannians. In computation, because we did it with, uh, with uh, Fourier techniques, we need the explicit eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. Okay, and on, on the point of the Grassmannian, so it's been asked, uh, can they be obtained from a point cloud? What can I obtain? Sorry? Can the, can, so the question is, can the Grassmannians or can those Grassmannians be obtained from a point cloud? Maybe, I don't know. So this is, as I said, we have a very special Grassmannian. No? As we, we don't do it for, uh, of course, you can... You, it's hard even to compute the eigenfunctions of these Grassmannians. And if you see, we don't do it for, for any Grassmannians. Uh, la, 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 la. Here. Oh, uh, no, this is the general curves. These are, no, no, these are uh, these special curves already. And um, then we have these results here. And here you see we do it for this very special Grassmannian. And, and I, don't, I don't know how to get it as a point cloud. I haven't thought about it, to be honest. I don't know. Okay, maybe it's uh, something for future life, maybe. Uh, it's time for one more question. Yeah, this is um, more, it's more on computation. We have to think more, this was more on mathematics behind and, and on, on this classical Fourier analysis. No? And, and the other point clouds and so on is uh, more how to compute this. But so we have here such a semi-discrete method as we can can really compute Fourier coefficients, could also do it on areas, yeah? Also, yeah. yeah, that makes sense, yeah. And the last question was more, more about how how exactly, because PCA got mentioned uh, at the start, what exactly the role of, how exactly this relates to PCA. So the question is, could we understand the work as generalizing methods like PCA into manifolds using Wasserstein? No, no, no. I just did it to give you a little bit, uh, a few and, and an appetizer why curves are maybe important. And that there exist different curves, maybe also in the summer school, we, you will hear a talk about um, PCA, I, I think, or, or, or I think spline curves or PCA on manifolds, for example, by Rumpf. And, and this was just to give you an appetizer, but these are, often very, very simple curves. You see, we have a very few points here. Or this is a little bit more, this is a continuous distribution, somehow a uniform distribution. But these things work for very simple distributions. Yeah, And there is, uh, so far, at, at least I don't see a relation to PCA or something like this. We did a lot of this Corobus PCA and all these things. We did also something, this is from a bachelor's thesis of mine here, these, these things. We do it on a hyperboloid, but it has 
nothing to do, even the spline curves has nothing to do with PCA. It's another function which you minimize. Here again, another function which you minimize. I had some hope that um, that uh, Benedict Wirt, I heard a talk of him about thin plate splines on um, spline curves on manifolds, but uh, I had a look at uh, to his web page and I couldn't find the, uh, this X should be done, go down. And I, I couldn't find uh, a paper on this, but I heard a talk I don't know, maybe one year ago, where he re, where he also generalizes these these things here, these thin plates blind to manifolds, and this is a very interesting functional here which you have to generalize. And then comes our method, and that's different. Try to make this with with PCA. How to do this one? As we, even with with two lines from PCA or so, it's really hard. And again, PCA. If you if you want just curves, just just the first PCA component on a manifold, it's still simple. But then in PCA, you usually want a subspace. And now comes the next question: How you can find these subspaces on a manifold at the end? But there exist people who have thought about it. For example, have a look into the papers of Panic. But again, this has nothing to do with this. It came a little bit because we had this reviewer for our paper who said, "Have a look at principal curves," and then we tried and realized no nothing to do with principal curves for such images. Okay, brilliant. Uh, that's all the time for questions we have. So, so perhaps you could join me in thanking Gabriella again. So unfortunately, not nothing about learning, but maybe next talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come back next year, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so at this point, there's going to be a company night and I think uh, Daniel will tell us a little more about that shortly. Uh, but for now, that's uh, that's the end of uh, tonight's talk. Uh, so I can leave now, or uh, uh, you you can if you wish. Uh, you can feel free to join in other parts of Logwell. That's that's perfectly fine. But um, you can uh, stay or go as as is uh, your preference. Maybe I will join some other talks because it's uh, seven o'clock in Germany and <laughs> I'm yeah. still in the office. <laughs> so uh, yeah. maybe I go home now. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank okay. You thank you very much again for the invitation. Not okay, bye. Bye-bye.